So welcome to the topic on visceral pain. This is the way we're going to structure the talk. We're going to discuss visceral pain as a general phenomena and then focus on chronic pelvic pain, which is, uh, which is a very common phenomenon, um, and then elaborate on chronic, chronic pelvic pain. There are other visceral pain syndromes, but we're going to focus on pelvic pain, which is a big one. So visceral pain is exactly what it says. Um, it is pain that originates from uh, the viscera of the body, and it's not the somatic structure, which is the covering of the body, uh, and the limbs, it's, it's from the internal structures of the body. Now, if you go to the IASP website, uh, there are a couple of clinical updates on visceral pain, and I, if you want to elaborate your reading from this material, from, from, from your, uh, this topic, uh, go to the website, download the, the clinical updates on visceral pain and have a read on them. Uh, they're slightly more detailed than what you're getting here. Um, and again, some of us are more interested in particular topics than others. But what, you, what you're about to get or what you've got already is, is, um, is a significant amount anyway. So there it is. There are the fantastic diagrams from da Vinci done way before um, anyone really got a sense of anatomy. Uh, he was by far um, way ahead of his time. And there it is. There's the viscera on one side of your screen, so the internal structures, um, so the thorax and abdomen essentially, and then there's the somatic uh, aspect which is the body covering, so the muscles and the joints and the skin. And it's important to get a handle on visceral pain. The best thing to do, or the best starting point, is to consider the difference between visceral nociception and somatic nociception. And let's go through this um, and really get a handle on the difference because it is important. So somatic nociception, as I've mentioned, it's pain that arises from the structures or from neural sources within the structures um, of the surface of the body. So skin, joint, bone, ligament, that's pretty much it. Visceral nociception is deeper from the deeper organs within the body. Now the pain of somatic nociception is rapid, it's well localized, and what it feels like is pain. Whereas pain from the viscera doesn't necessarily need to feel like pain. It can be a slow kind of pain, a delayed kind of pain, poorly localized, and things like colic can present as um, you know visceral nociception. Autonomic features associated with pain, so the somatic nociception, they have the classic fight or flight kind of switch on um, autonomic features, so the hypervigilance, the tachycardia, the hypertensions, the sweating, the dilated pupils. So that's pretty easy to recognize when somatic nociception is occurring. Now visceral nociception tends to be more emotional, um, tends to have more of a pa parasympathetic kind of activity. So nausea, vomiting, hypertension, bradycardia, that's visceral nociception. So as you can see, as we're going down the, this table, we're getting an idea about the difference. What is visceral nociception? And that's the initial kind of thing we need to understand. The referral pattern for somatic nociception um, well, it's generally because it is the soma of the body, uh, the covering of the body, you can localize it quite easily. So there's not much referral. Whereas the visceral nociception is associated with referral patterns or more likely to be associated with referral patterns. And then the innovation is, um, is important to differentiate the two. So what I've been briefly talking about, we pretty much already know. But the slightly di the differences come down when you when you really focus on the neurons and how the neurons work. So so somatic is high density innervation, which makes complete sense. Hence visceral lower density innervation. The the somatic nociceptors are. Um, are highly developed. They're, they're really specialized. So the mechano, the thermoreceptors, whereas um, visceral, they're less developed. They're more uh, primitive, really. They're unspecialized mechanoreceptors. They're not really thermoreceptors. Um, they're high threshold receptors when you're looking at somatic nociception. Um, and they're more, when you look at visceral side, there's the fewer unmyelinated afferents. So these are just the, the subtle differences between the two. They're less collaterals when you're looking at somatics, whereas with visceral nociception, they're more collaterals, which makes sense, doesn't it? It's quite hard to localize. It comes from around this kind of area. Um, visceral pain, 
highly um, they're, they're high representation topographically on the cerebral cortex so sorry that's somatic pain so highly representative um, and think about the hands uh, the feet um, the the head, the head. Uh, think about the cerebral homunculus whereas viscera are not really represented that highly on the cerebral cortex somatic pain is fast well localized real pain as we know pain and that's a delta kind of mediated fibers whereas um, visceral pain is more c fiber slow dull slightly delayed um, and so what I've been saying is that somatic nociception is really uh, specialized whereas visceral nociception is really um, uh, not well developed and it's more rudimentary and that also is visible in the pathways that it travels to so somatic nociception travel in the so-called neospinal ascending pathways and that gets to the, the 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 primary cerebral cortex whereas the visceral nociception they tend to travel in what's called the paleospinal so the really kind of the older uh, tracts and they get to the brain stem and lower centers of the brain so they don't get to the top and the outer covering of the brain so that's the way you can see the difference between visceral and somatic other interesting things the viscera you can have so-called silent pain and there are silent nociceptors that can get activated with inflammation uh, which is unique to visceral uh, visceral pain. Um, they can have dual innervation, of course. Yes, they get a vagal innervation as well, which is which is important. And then the nociceptors, as I've said, just I've just wanted to put this put this in for completeness sake. You get wide dynamic kind of tonic mechanoreceptors with visceral nociception. Uh, high threshold mechanoreceptors, yes. And as I've mentioned before, the silent so-called mechanoreceptors that get activated with inflammatory uh, conditions or local inflammation. So the difference between somatic and visceral pain or visceral nociception, an important difference to make. And then let's stick on with the visceral pain. And you've got slightly more detailed in your reading matter, but the way to, to structure visceral pain or the way to classify visceral pain is you've got visceral pain, and you've got referred pain and when you see somebody with visceral pain or when you think they've got visceral pain you need to decide what kind of classification it is so is it true visceral pain is it pain arising from a viscera associated with a tissue insult is it visceral hyperalgesia and we are seeing a lot of this now and that's essentially neuropathic pain arising from a viscera slowly local uh, slow poor localized so that visceral kind of pain but why is it hyperalgesic? Because there's no tissue insult that's occurring at the moment. Um, so uh, something that's occurred, the inflammation has disappeared, and they're now left with hyperalgesia, central sensitization. So is this true visceral pain? So, and when I've mentioned true visceral pain, of course, I've got my diagnostic uh, acute hat on, and this is the people that come in with visceral, um, visceral pathology. So true visceral pain, visceral hyperalgesia, or is this visceral hyperalgesia, which is an interesting phenomena? And I mean, one of those pain updates from the ISP, you can read about it in detail. But essentially, it's exactly what it says. The viscera have common pathways, so two different viscera, common pathways. And um, um, because they've got common pathways, pain in one viscera can lead to a hyperalgesic phenomena in another viscera. So example, gallbladders, coronary heart disease, if you've got two of those um, uh, phenomena, you tend to have painful episodes, but if, but if they're related, the painful episodes tend to be uh, more severe. Um, and other things are kind of uh, would include the genitourinary system, so uh, endometriosis and urinary abnormalities as well, two different viscera. If they correlated, they may one may lead to hyperalgesia in the other or be associated with hyperalgesia in the other. Phenomenal, phenomenal stuff really. And then of course referred pain because it is viscera, it can refer, not as much as, um, um, not like somatic pain as we've just said, um, but the referred can the referred pain can be associated with hyperalgesia or without hyperalgesia. And so referred pain without hyperalgesia is exactly that. It's sharp, it's localized. That's the appendicitis that turns into um, uh, something else and referred pain to the soma. And then, of course, you can get um, hyperalgesia as well. 
and that's from a ph phenomena called convergence facilitation which I've briefly mentioned so when you've got visceral pain uh, whether it be an acute or a chronic phenomena think about the visceral think about the referred phenomena and think about whether there's hyperalgesia and diagnose the hyperalgesia so the referred pain with hyperalgesia and if you look for it you'll find it so if you've got referred pain to the structure or the, the covering of the body to the soma you've got somebody with a gynecological um, uh, visceral pain syndrome and they've got some pain on the upper uh, aspect of the lower abdomen um, you examine them and you get localized muscle hyperalgesia even trigger points and and skin changes as well they can get to the point where you even get neuropathic features in the covering of the body so in that lower abdominal area you can get patients not only with dem demonstrable hyperalgesia but they can also display uh, skin changes and color changes as well and, and display the allodynias and hyperalgesias uh, that you would expect with, um, with neuropathic pain phenomena or syndromes. Really interesting stuff. So chronic pelvic pain, let's move away from visceral pain. We've got an idea about the viscera. We can tell the difference between visceral and somatic. And let's move on to one of the, one of the visceral areas, and that's the pelvic region. So chronic pelvic pain, non-malignant pain perceived in structures that are related to the pelvis, because the pelvis is full of structures, but it's pain that is perceived in the pelvis. Um, it can occur in men and women and we think about pelvic pain as just a female thing but it's not it's a male thing and a female thing and it can be chronic now it can be strictly speaking uh, the the chronicity if it can either be f there for more than six months if you've got the nociceptive pain or that pain that just continues or if you if you want to diagnose chronic pain before six months of six months have arrived you need to document uh, central sensitization so that's a good definition of chronic pelvic pain and that comes from, an, from a fairly uh, good article, a fairly thorough article from Andrew Baranofsky in the UK. Um, it might be worth having a read um, of this article. There's a lot of nomenclature, it focuses on the taxonomy of chronic pelvic pain because one person might say pelvic pain and mean something completely different. So again, it comes back down to what we mean when we say something and that's why it's important to get our definitions right. But that's quite a good definition of pelvic pain. Non-malignant, structures, pelvis, men, women and chronic. That's it. Whereas if you have a look at other um, other societies um, or associations such as the ISP International Continence Society yes there is one um, they've each got their own definition for pelvic pain and there are some uh, I wouldn't say flaws but there's some things that are forgotten in each one or some things that are not com completely in um, uh, enclosing so the ISP tends to focus on gynecological problems um, and there are flaws in each one I could you could probably say but I like that definition um, non malignant pelvis men woman and chronic that's it keep it simple it's a common phenomenon as well and there's some surveys that were done in the US and the UK and that found that um, it occurs commonly uh, pelvic pain, irritable bowel. One of the uh, an article found that about 28% of gastrointestinal practices patients were complaining of irritable bowel, and that is a functional pain syndrome. It is it can lead to pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain. Now, of course, remembering when you're talking about pelvic pain, this could be pelvic pain syndromes and non-pelvic pain syndromes. So you could you, you could have pain perceived in the pelvis but it's not coming from the pelvis. So you could have upper GI or urogenital procedures, so kidney problems, and it can be perceived as coming from the pelvis. So you've got to think, okay, they think it's coming from the pelvis. Is it coming from the pelvis? Let me first diagnose it. Most of these things had a trigger. Most of these pelvic syndromes or these pain syndromes had a trigger. They may not be actively causing inflammation, disease at the moment, but there was a trigger. There usually is a trigger. And that trigger may have not be pelvic as such. So pelvic pain syndrome. So when you said, fine, this is a pelvic pain syndrome, 
you've got to define where where in the pelvis, which viscera does it come from in the pelvis? Is it neurolog is it urological? Is it gynecological? Is it gastrointestinal? And I've given you some uh, f uh, figures as well. Some things occur more commonly than others. Example: anorectal uh, occurs slightly more commonly than gynecological. But if you break it down, if you break down pelvic pain syndromes. Um, and you say, fine, it's a gynecological problem. Well, you've got to say, well, which gynecological problem is this? Is this a, v a vaginal pain syndrome? Is this a vulval pain syndrome? Is this an endometriosis-like pain syndrome? So these are regional pain syndromes as such. So you've said pelvis, and now you've got to subdivide it into various aspects of the pelvis. And the urological one, there's a lot going on in the urolo urological system. Bladder, urethra, prostate. Uh, scrotal, penile, etc. And then of course neurological and muscular. Always got to consider muscular. A lot of gynecologists talk a lot about pelvic floor muscle pain syndromes. They examine patients um, um, in a very detailed manner. This is certainly something I as a pain physician would never do. Um, and they get a sense from experience about pelvic floor issues, particularly even localized trigger points. We are moving away from the end organ discussion on nomenclature because if, as we are understanding pelvic pain syndromes or chronic pelvic pain is a, is a central sensitization phenomena, we need, to, we need to get them out of this kind of um, aspect where you're focusing on a particular organ. So the pelvic pain syndrome is subdivided into the, 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 the viscera from which it arises, but we're now I think we should be moving, certainly from reading that one article from Baranowski, we're moving away from that end organ kind of discussion. It doesn't really matter. Exclude the red flags, get them into a chronic disease paradigm or disease management paradigm. So here are the mechanisms and um, good article as I've mentioned. Whereas it's a, it's a changing phenomena, it's a process, you get a, a, an, an organ, an acute event and initiating factor that leads to tissue damage and inflammation that in turn may you may be genetically wired in such a way you may be environmentally um, exposed in such a way to lead to the chronic pelvic pain syndrome so within the pelvis that can lead to a regional kind of pelvic pain syndromes or regional pain syndrome should I say not pelvic so that progresses onwards and then, of course, to a systemic syndrome as well, so they get the whole kind of um, body phenomena of pain syndromes. So one can lead to the next and vice and, and so on until you've got a systemic syndrome. And at any point, you could lead to resolution. And at any point, if managed appropriately, you could uh, turn back the clock and move from the more uh, uh, advanced aspects to the less advanced aspects so you can change this disease. So here it is in a, just another feature. So the regional pelvic pain syndrome, so that's the, um, that's the, uh, the, the light blue you've got there. So initiator, tissue damage, chronic pelvic pain, regional pelvic pain are things like, so I might get a problem with the anorectal area or the GIT area, and that in itself can lead to changes within the local smooth muscle um, changes within smooth muscle function locally or changes within the striated muscle locally as well. So a problem with the um, uh, anorectal uh, uh, part of the GI tract can actually lead to smooth muscle changes and local kind of pelvic um, striated muscle changes as well. So the pelvic pain syndrome leads to another regional pain syndrome. So you might get smooth muscle dysfunction so in the anorectal bladder area, and that leads to constipation, urinary retention, dyssynergy when bladder, when, uh, with bladder function. The striated muscle, the localized regional area, the striated muscle, you might get trigger points, dyspareunia, um, and enthesitis, which is enthesitis is um, inflammation at the insertion of a tendon. So as you can see, one thing leads to another. Uh, the systemic symptoms that patients with chronic pelvic pain might get, musculoskeletal symptoms, so they get, they get symptoms in their thorax, they get symptoms in their shoulders, symptoms in their neck. They get headaches, they get TM joy, uh, TM joint, uh, TMJ problems as well. 
So again, I, what I'm showing you is that one aspect leads to a whole range of problems. So initiator, an organ becomes inflamed, has a disease process, call it endometriosis, which is a whole different topic to discuss, of course. That leads to inflammation and tissue damage. That might heal. You're left with a pelvic pain syndrome, so this is a central sensitization phenomena. That in itself can lead to uh, changes in the region, so smooth muscle changes, striated muscle changes, and that in itself then leads to systemic changes as well. And of course, throw into the mix psychological aspects, social aspects. Um, so the systemic symptoms, this whole range of symptoms leads to problems when they have sexual encounters. Um, depression, anxiety, pain catastrophizing, and all the the negative features associated with, e with each of those. So that's the, the chronic pelvic pain kind of basket, as you will, of so many things that can occur following one minor initiating trigger. Now the differential diagnosis, we've got our pain hats on, we have to consider secondary causes or diseases or illnesses that can be treated um, and a lot of these patients have been investigated time and time again they get laparoscopy after laparoscopy they've got a bit of endometriosis but they get repeated and repeated and repeated surgeries um, and ultimately what you want is you want to work hand in hand with your gynecological colleague with your uh, gastroenterology colleague with your urologist colleague with your neurology colleague and you want to get these patients um, you want to get the diagnosis excluded so you want to get it done you want to exclude the bad things you want to exclude the cancers you want to exclude the infections and once that's done you want to stop investigations you want to really get them away from that into the chronic um, disease management paradigm that is pain management you want to get them away from that acute kind of paradigm and you want to get them right into that chronic paradigm I don't want to uh, elaborate any further but if somebody asks you about your differential diagnosis GIT urology gynecological and we're, we like classifying things uterine extra uterine um, there it is there's endometriosis it's another discussion it occurs with and without chronic pelvic pain. Don't forget about musculoskeletal issues, so sacroiliatus, vertebral fractures, all the red flags. Neuropathic features, again, the hepatic neuralgias, the, 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 the radiating neuropathies from the back, all the dangerous things, the tumors, the infections, and then psychiatric as well, you have to consider it. So it's a nice differential approach to pelvic pain. You've got to go through this whenever somebody presents to you with pelvic pain. And then the management, as you've seen before, it's a five-stage or five-pronged approach. Manage the medical side of things, uh, modify the medication, give them analgesia, uh, give them interventions. It's a, it may be a short-term or a diagnostic tool. Focus on the physical aspects and what the, f what the goals are for your patient. Focus on the functional aspects psychological um, aspects so look at cognitive behavioral therapy look at cognitive restructuring behavioral modification self-confidence locus of control pain catastrophizing this is the chronic pelvic pain treatment algorithm isn't it and of course education is so vital T talk to them about acutes versus the chronic paradigms stress and pain uh, teach them about opioids and the use of opioids and opioids should not be used in these patients um, there is my understanding there is not a role for opioids is not governed by high evidence and then just a brief couple of general specific things not of the general management but the specific management again common sense must prevail uh, see each of your patients individually and treat uh, your patient some analgesics may actually be beneficial, their side effects may be beneficial in these patients, such as duloxetine might be useful in patients with stress incontinence. Uh, the tricyclic, so imipramine, might be useful where, where um, urinary problems, urinary symptoms are actually a problem. So you're tailoring the drug to the patient, to the symptoms, so you need to find out a bit about their symptoms. 
SSRIs may be useful if anticholinergic side effects are a problem, but of course we know SSRIs are not really uh, governed by evidence to treat central sensitization. Nevertheless, they might play a role in your patient if there's a strong depression or anxiety component. Um, Mirtazapine, if depression is more is more of an issue, that was based on some of the some of the um, treatments from the uh, Baranowski paper. And then, of course, some of the medication we use may actually have more detrimental effects on patients with pelvic pain compared to somebody that you might have with back pain. So opioids and tramadol might make the constipation worse might make the urinary hesitancy worse, might change the sexual desires, uh, might lead to erectile problems as well. Of course, whenever you talk about opioids, consider the long-term effects of opioids and the risks. So opioid risk stratify your patients. Are they at risk of getting um, aberrant behaviors and, and, dare I say, even abuse? Not common in opioids, but it, the, the risks are there. So risk stratify your patients if you think opioids are going to be appropriate. Um, antidepressants might cause a number of problems. So constipation, again, urinary hesitation, uh, changes in orgasmic sensation, um, changes in ejaculation. This might be very important to your patients. So these are the, so we are slightly out of our comfort zone here as pain specialists, so I certainly am talking about these things with patients. And that's why it, it needs to be done hand in hand with a gynecologist, somebody that does this every day. Anticonvulsants, the old anticonvulsants such as carbamazepine might cause problems that make things worse. So the gynecomastias, the galactereas. Blocks might be useful. Um, various local nerve blocks may have a diagnostic, uh, may have a diagnostic element to it, may have a... Um, an analgesia modulation effect as well, so give your patient short-term relief, might allow you to build up a rapport with your patient, get them on your side. Trigger points, yes, done by an expert. And Botox can be useful uh, in some of these patients as well. Surgical treatment for chronic pelvic pain will, from what we understand, no. If there is something that needs treating, yes. So if there is endometriosis that needs treatment, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have to rely on my gynecologist colleagues to make that decision, but I can impress with them uh, things about the patient that they may overlook. Um, laparoscopic uterine nerve ablation, there is no strong evidence to support its use in chronic pelvic pain. And it makes sense not to treat the, the periphery if this is a central sensitization problem, doesn't it? Because you might be taking away that little piece of endometriosis. Uh, it may spring up elsewhere, but if, this, if the cord and the dorsal horn has been sensitized, well, what you're doing is not going to be useful. And then again, we're talking a lot about neuromodulation, so sacral neuromodulation. It's used quite a lot um, for non-pelvic pain problems, so uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, um, um, motor incontinence, motor urge incontinence, urinary retention, so sacral stimulation has been used for the, those reasons. But whereas sacral modulation for pelvic pain, um, we're still early days, and I think there is some evidence to support, but this and we're gaining momentum um, and this might be a feature more so in the future but it's definitely there it's all about patient selection and then of course if you've got specific pelvic pain syndromes you focus on specific treatments for those pelvic pain syndromes such as gynecological versus urological um, and that there are some treatments that are that are um, tailored to the to the syndrome that you might diagnose that's out of the scope of this discussion but um, I direct you to one of your references that's the guideline the treatment guidelines on chronic pelvic pain um, and that's the European Association of Urology treatment guidelines and there's quite an in-depth uh, discussion uh, um, on various pelvic pain syndromes Just a brief word on pelvic congestion, congestion syndrome. There's a big fibroid, and that 
can lead to um, problems with venous drainage and drainage and you get congestion so vascular congestion and that is a cause of pelvic pain so this is a secondary cause of pelvic pain that needs to be considered and looked for by my gynecological colleagues um, and there are some specific treatments for this anti-inflammatories hormones embolization and some have even said uh, hysterectomy oophorectomy and hormone replacement for the really intractable um, uh, cases but again far out of my um, comfort zone and certainly again hand in hand with a gynecological colleague but the important thing is to let you know that these things exist so that brings us to the end of this discussion